Hi there, Nick here from Conservation Careers and welcome to the podcast. Now, have you ever considered going back to university and doing a master's degree in order to become more employable within the sector? Perhaps you looked at many programmes and wondered if they are really tooling you up the right skills that employers value. Well, in today's podcast, we're speaking with Dr. Stephen Green, who's the course leader for an exciting new master's programme designed and delivered in partnership with us at Conservation Careers to train you in the core skills used by professionals day to day. We discuss who the new MSc in Conservation Project Management is for. We also chat about the emphasis on core conservation skills, such as project management, communications and fundraising. And we finally explore the programme's flexibility, allowing students like you to pursue various conservation paths and receive career development support throughout. Stephen then discusses his career journey with us, explaining what it's like to be a lecturer in zoology and a course leader within a university environment and how he got there. Finally, he shares his career advice for people like you who might be seeking to follow in his footsteps. It's a master's musing, snake studying and employment enhancing pod chat. Enjoy. I'm Stephen Green and I'm a lecturer in, uh, in zoology and in, in conservation at Newquay University Centre, which is part of the Cornwall College Group and the Plymouth University programmes that we run. And yeah, and the co-curator, sort of co-writer of the, the new Masters in, in Conservation Project Management or Conservation Management as it's likely to become. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. And Stephen, it's it's such a pleasure having you on the podcast and getting to know you the last year or two as well, actually, and now kind of jumping in and having this discussion and talking about this new Masters programme. Talking about your career as well, you've had quite an interesting, exciting career yourself uh, and the work that you mm. do right now uh, and hearing your advice. So we were just talking before the pre-chat, like where to start, it, it, one sort of leads to another. But I think maybe the best way I'd re- for us to start is to kind of talk specifically about this master's programme that we've kind of been co-creating. I know you're leading on it, you'll be delivering it, but we've been doing it sort of in collaboration together the last year or two. And I'm really excited to kind of see it actually launching this year and starting in September. Mm-hmm. So. As you say, it's the Masters in Conservation Project Management or Masters in Conservation Management. We're trying to drop the project at the moment, so we'll see. (laughs) Um, Who? Let's start. Who is it for? Like, who is the Masters program for? Let's start at that that point. That's a great place to to start. And the answer to that is, it's for anyone who wants to work in conservation, essentially. And it's you. it will attract, we hope, you know, people who are on that traditional maybe route through they've done a, a zoology or conservation degree and are looking to then go on to, to master's level study. Um, but it's also recognising that conservation is a really, really broad field that needs people with a wide range of different kinds of backgrounds. Um, and so, you know, as we'll, we'll get into talking about, you know, it's it's about funding mechanisms it's about communications um and so it's it's for anyone who wants a career in conservation would like to gain the sorts of skills that have been identified by conservation careers and others that you know recognizing that to get a job in conservation there are all kinds of things in project management skills funding um as well as the traditional sort of ecology um knowledge and background um, so if you've been working for a conservation organization or you've been doing lots of volunteering and you want your career, you know, doing that career switch into conservation, but you don't have necessarily that that full background in the, the zoology side of it or, or conservation, um, then that's that's fine. This this program is about taking people that have a skill set, recognizing they're going to have some gaps in that. And uh, and then being able to create their own path through this to develop the skills that they want or that you want that get you the job that you want to do. And that's going to be very different for somebody that really wants to go into conservation marketing versus somebody that wants to kind of go down more the, the traditional field ecology and research route. Right. And, and this program is for um, you know, in, designed intentionally to cater for all those types of people. Yeah, I think what I find really exciting about it and, and why we've been working with you and why we're kind of um, excited about where this, where these things go is you kind of 
you started from a fairly kind of blank canvas approach of like, what do employers look for? You know, the academic sector has done a great job of training people up in lots of kind of knowledge and skills, particularly within the academic sphere. So ecology and zoology and so forth. Mm -hmm. But actually some of the kind of practical skills that employers are looking for out in the sector are sometimes missed. So as you said, project management and fundraising, communications, all the stuff that we've been learning on our side, you're looking to develop a course around and deliver so people become more employable. That's right. Um, and that's from from my experience, and we'll, we'll probably get into talking about my my background experience at some point, but um, was essentially kind of followed that traditional um, academic route and um, did my PhD and then was working for uh, a conservation organization, working working for Operation Wallacea and being expected to do all of these things that I hadn't really had any training to do. Um, yeah, managing budgets, managing staff, recruiting staff, doing all these other things, you know, applying for research, perhaps doing all the logistics, field logistics. Um, and yeah, managing programs that was quite, be, you know, it, it was outside of my comfort zone. It was outside of my training. And you learn as you go. And, you know, th those people that are working in conservation or, or I guess any, um, any role, um, you, you often have to kind of learn as you go. But it's, it's recognizing that when you do that, you don't necessarily learn any kind of formal kind of structures or ways of doing it it's a constant journey and, and there's definitely a a, a, you know, a better way of doing that where, where there are people with expertise in these areas who can sort of fast track you to, to being able to do jobs in a more effective and efficient way and, and conservation really needs that because time and, and, and funding is limited and so being able to to do things uh, in a, a more effective way is mm. is kind of what, what we need at this stage and, and what this is about. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I guess that that was part of the reason you and organisations. We, you know, I start when I started teaching in in higher education, which sort of kind of the, the flip side of this. One of the modules that that I do teach is, is conservation project management, and that was born out of the fact that employers were saying, we, "We've got these graduates coming out of these programs, not not just for from our institution, but from kind of all over, and they've got wonderful knowledge of uh, evolution and ecology and kind of conservation in, in principle, but um, they don't have those skills that we really need." working on a day-to-day -day basis in an organization, those sort of those teamwork skills and um, and yeah, you know, being able to know how to use social media and, and kind of knowing about marketing and um, and human behavior change and, and working with people, you know, people get into conservation usually because they're interested in studying biodiversity. You know, it's, it's the animals and it's the plants and it's all the, the ex that exciting stuff. And then you recognize as you go through that journey that, it's actually about people and you know we would say conservation it's it's about people uh which it is um and knowing how to work with people is kind of forgotten in the the traditional training and and that's that's sort of okay um because you need to know about the other stuff as well but at a master's level it's it it's kind of that's the time to say right now we need to look at the other element of this um and really kind of get on top of how how people work and and how we can work effectively in teams um and so so as part of our program here this this conservation project management mod module which some of our students do in their their final year level sort of in their third year level six um that was because employers were saying we need people to have some of these skills so we started doing it we started getting students involved in running their own conservation projects and and doing crowdfunding campaigns and, and doing kind of social media marketing stuff. Um, and what we quickly, what I quickly recognized was there's too much. You know, there's too much to fit into this one module. This is an entire program. You know, and there were all these things that I wanted to share with students. And um, and I pushed them too hard and uh, probably nearly broke some people, which, you know, they were, um, you know, if you ever come across some of our graduates there, no, and they're going through this process at the moment. Um, and, you know, they're, they're coming to me and saying, you know, this is this is a really, really tough module. And I'm saying, 
yeah, you know, I, I recognize I'm, I'm, I'm asking a lot, um, but it's this masters will allow a lot of that, you know, what, what I've been trying to squeeze into it to one module to be expanded out into a, a whole year of uh, 180 credits. Of, of masters which mm. gives us loads of room to play around with stuff um in in a very different uh, and exciting way um and you know the, the collaboration with conservation careers and all the exciting materials that you have uh, available and how that's all going to kind of dovetail together is i think really really exciting yeah yeah i totally agree yeah i mean it's interesting like it sort of reflects my con- my career a little bit too actually in terms of like learning as we go like you were touching on there at the beginning you know so I started off in communications early in my career did two or three years of kind of communications management at bird life and learned on the job and kind of got you know reasonably good at it and so on and recently we developed a communications program a training program which we're folding into this master's uh, communications for conservation projects and just through working with the course leader Lloyd on that I feel I could have learned in about two or three weeks what I learned in three years in the job mm-hmm. You're not just speeding up a progression and, and understanding how to do stuff. And yes, learning job is one way, but actually you can formalize this. And then you just work so much quicker and more effectively being taught by mm-hmm. someone directly who knows this sort of stuff. So, you know, I, to- I totally attest to kind of the approach that you're taking to this. Let's talk nuts and bolts then. So what, what's actually included in the master's program starting in September? Or what, what does it look like? What modules or, you know, what would people learn as, as they go through it? Yeah, so... The, I've, I've been trying to figure out the best way of kind of talking somebody through the program, mm. and, and I think that that there are there are some core well there, there are core modules, and then there's a sort of an optional field trip. You can kind of go different directions. But the way I would explain it is that um, we have we've written it all around the idea of kind of the conservation standards and being best practice for conservation. And so there's a there's a core module within the masters where you will which which dovetails with the project management design the uh, project design um, uh, course through conservation careers, mm. which is about learning how to use the conservation standards um, as a yeah a, a mechanism to do conservation that is internationally agreed as best practice so that everybody's using the same kind of vocabulary and doing things in the same way. But the, at the heart of that is this reflective practice idea, which is nothing new. It's, it's kind of management in, in that you you do something, you evaluate whether it's working, and based on that evaluation, you then um, adapt and and share that, that information so that we can all do conservation better. And that, that circle practice can be applied at kind of a micro level or kind of bigger levels in in managing projects and so throughout this course students will learn how to use that and that reflective process um, and then use it to sort of apply within the module itself and doing coursework of uh, applying it to specific case studies and allowing students to then look at their own case studies that they're interested in sort of conservation ideas uh, and eventually that will filter all the way through to your final project that you do, where you then you you apply that to exactly what you're doing, assessing, evaluating a conservation issue, working with partners, doing something, evaluating whether that works, and then you, you'll write that up. Okay. So so that's kind of, I, I, I think, I feel like that's the heart of the program, that everything wraps around. But... Um, what we've got sitting either side of that and the two other modules that we're um we're partnering with conservation careers in terms of your, your content it's the the conservation funding module and the, the communications um for, for conservation uh, and so recognizing that in order to be successful in conservation we need to be able to communicate with with different stakeholders um in a variety of different ways stakeholders but also you know when we're communicating with with funders and when we're writing you know creating um you know our, our website um content we need to be able to communicate effectively that's part of the, the the strategy um we need to be able to bring money in and and we need to be able to communicate effectively to bring money in and so those modules will be running kind of side by side um helping um, sort of uh, you know, crossing over uh, content to, to 
some extent. And and sitting in the middle of that is the the, the, the conservation standards and, and design. And so when you come out the other side of kind of doing your project, and I think this is one of the things that makes this a really nice um, I, the things that I'm excited about is that you'll have people coming in from different directions and, and wanting to go out in different trajectories. And so when you get around to that final project that you do, you'll use the conservation standards to figure out what the problem is. And if the problem is that this conservation organization that you're kind of working with needs to communicate their messages better to their stakeholders to bring around some kind of human behavior change, then you're using your communication skills that you've learned to try and do that. If you think that there's actually a funding deficit here and that we need, you know, they, they just need more money to do, they've got loads of good ideas, but they just don't have the funding or the skills to all kind of the time to do that, then the final year project can be all about exploring how to get the funding in and actually raising that funding. And that's a, a measurable objective, right? And that you can collect data on and you can analyze that data. So it doesn't have to be a traditional science MSC. It, it, it's, it's about doing something, but collecting data to evaluate whether you have done that thing. Yeah. However, if you are the kind of person that's coming into this because you love field work and you actually want to go somewhere and you know you want to collect data using camera traps and you know, do some modeling and and do the that side of stuff then this is for you as well because that is if you do your evaluation of what is needed and it comes back that we just don't know enough about this species or about this species in this particular area and therefore there's a, a more of a kind of a traditional ecological survey that's needed and data analysis then then that's what you go and do uh, so it's it's really broad in what you can go and do. Mm. Um, and it's in, in, it's similarly broad in, in the students that we're hoping to attract onto this, because the other, one of the other modules that you'll do, which um, fits in, it, you know, so it, it utilizes um, the Kickstarter program through conservation careers. And it's all about you come in and you evaluate from day one what skill sets what skill set do you have um, and what is the job that you want to go on ultimately do and recognizing kind of like, okay, so what are the steps that you need? What are the things that you don't yet have? Some of that you'll get through the course itself, um, but not everyone wants to go in the same direction. You're all coming in from different directions. You're going to go out in different directions. And so your journey um, may be extremely different actually to another person that's, that's on this course. You're all doing the same modules, but, you've got the opportunity to do different things. And so as part of that module, you you kind of go through reflective practice, creating a professional development plan, looking at your CV, and you identify training needs. And then through um, the program, we give back to you. So there's a uh, sort of a career development grant that you apply for or that you're eligible for that you can then invest back in yourself to go and do some specific training that you feel you need. So if you feel that you know there's something that you're not getting as part of the actual masters, um, you know, we can't provide everything because it's just you know it's, there's too many things. But like if you identified, I really want to go and work in Central America, and therefore I need to improve my Spanish or I need to kind of get some beginner Spanish, then you can take that money and you can go off and do a Spanish course. And then at the end of the program, you're then reflecting on how that additional training has benefited you. How has that improved your employability? Or it might be that you feel that you actually need to go and do um, you know, some additional GIS training, or you might want to go and do a course that improves your knowledge of conservation genetics. Or, um, you know, there'll be opportunities to engage with content that you may be able to access through the college and the university anyway that you won't have to pay for but there's there's a pot of money that's designed specifically so that um you know it, it's a finite amount but but there's something there that allows every individual to create their own journey through this um and really think about it invest in themselves because um yeah everyone's going to want to get something different out of it yeah and I'm so excited about it. I mean, the flexibility that's coming through, as you describe it, is going to be really important for people. Um, and it's so innovative. It's so forward thinking, I think. And it's really needed in the sector, this sort of approach to delivering core skills 
alongside that delivering opportunities for people to kind of develop their own skills in terms of gaps in the direction they personally want to take um before we kind of talk about your role in your career which is equally as interesting like um what's what's your vision five ten years out what do you hope the impact of the program is going to be five ten twenty years down the road you know what what are you hopeful about i mean what what I would love to see is a a community of, of people who have come through this program who are out working in conservation and they're talking about oh yeah I I came through um, Newfield University Centre and I I did the you know the conservation management or conservation project management masters um, you know, so just to clarify for people so at the moment it's it's advertised as conservation project management but but obviously Nick and I have been discussing this and possibly conservation management is a better fit and so we're going through the process of um requesting and changing we have to wait to see if that's allowed but essentially it's it's the same program yeah. and so i you know would love to see people working out there just saying that they, they've been through this this program and that they found it useful you know and that they you know, that the feedback is coming back saying that it helped people to get the job that they they want to get um and also on the the other side of that employers coming back and saying that oh yeah there's another person that's got this and they've got the skills that we need and we want and um and recognizing it as a, a mm-hmm. as a masters that produces some really employable people that go on to do great stuff and and are effective in conservation because that's what ultimately we want i love that like a kite mark of excellence really yeah that we know graduates from this program are really employable and they're making a real difference yeah amazing well as i say it starts in september but people can start looking into it now we'll provide a link and talk a little bit more about the end about how, how people can find out more um, but let's kind of crunch gears then and let's kind of talk a bit about you and your work, Stephen. So you are, you're a program manager, you're a lecturer, you're obviously going to be a course leader as well in this new master's program. Like, How would you describe your job to people who don't know you or don't know your work? You bumped into someone in the pub, say, so what do you do? How do you describe yeah, it? Yeah, that, that's always a really difficult one. When yeah. people would ask me what I do, I I was finding it quite difficult to say. I mean, I so I I teach at Newquay University Centre, which is a um, so we are we deliver higher education, but with sort of within the college um, Cornwall College Group system, but we're a partner college with University of Plymouth. So the the BSc programs that we run and the masters that we run are University of Plymouth programs, mm-hmm. um, but we also, as a college, have our own foundation degree awarding power. So some of our um, foundation degrees are sort of in house, and we create those and deliver those and award them ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but here we we're, we're quite unique here at uh, Newquay in that we're a fully higher education site, um, and so all of our students are, are doing some sort of degree program. It all fits around um, what we would kind of call our environmental sciences, and we within it we have uh, so I teach across program. Um, zoology and conservation, ecology, um, you know, there's marine zoology. Um, but we also have a, a, a surf science program here. We're, we're about to launch um, a, a sort of a coastal adventures foundation degree as well. So it's all about you know, being down here in Cornwall and uh, and making the most of the environment that's on our doorstep, um, whether that, you know, both biodiversity, but also um, just the ecosystems and, um, you know, the natural spaces as well but but my my role i i teach and i manage um a currently a applied zoology bsc top-up program and teach across a, a range of um of modules my background my, my phd was kind of in, in biodiversity management but with a large focus on conservation genetics and so i teach across genetics modules here um but also because of my um experience of working in the field i, I teach you know, conservation project management and kind of the logistics and and, and actually a, a wide range of things so you know, i'll be going from kind of teaching i'll be running genetics labs in the morning through to kind of running talking about um conservation marketing in, in sort of in the afternoon and and then running honors projects and stat sessions and everything in between so it's it keeps keeps me busy in in, in that side of things um and then yeah when i'm not teaching i'm i'm getting involved in, in sort of conservation work so i 
Um, I'm the science officer for Cornwall Reptile and Amphibian Group. And yet, yeah, like a lot of local groups, we, we try to be as active as we can and there's never as, as much time as you want. Finally got out um, for my first adder surveys yesterday and um, we're, we're doing you know, the first genetics of, of Cornish adder populations that, that I'm aware of. And so uh, there's that, that side of it. So I still try to get out and be actively involved. Um, we, any others we yesterday? Managed... Did you spot any? Yeah, yeah, we um, um, managed to. Uh, there was um, four male adders out, and, uh, and and a little baby juvenile as well, which was lovely oh. to see. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that side of it. Um, and we ran. Um, we were running some sand lizard uh, training just a few weeks ago as well um, with Amphibian uh, Reptile Conservation Trust to try and get local volunteers being able to to work with um, European protected species and sand lizards, um, which is always a bit tricky for um, for you know, local organisations when you've got those kind of licensing issues. So, yeah, I, I guess I teach, and but w as much as possible around busy family life and kids try to get out and, and get involved in, um, you know, in conservation here. But um, but then, you know, my, my background as we, we're going to, uh, more sort of international conservation. I, I, I take students out, so have been taking students out from here to uh, to Honduras on the the. Um, so uh, we run a field course. There's there's one that we run to Borneo, um, which is actually leaving in a couple of days. So uh, a couple of our staff members are taking students out to Borneo for a field trip. Um, but I I've been involved in kind of setting up and running the, the Honduras field trip that we run from here because of what I used to do with Operation Wallace here and the field side out there. Um, so yeah, it's it's a kind of a, a mad mix of teaching and field stuff here, and um, not as much as it used to be, but um, where where possible, um, international field stuff as well. Sounds like a really interesting mix of stuff that you're still managing to juggle and to keep the kind of things that you're interested about. What what would you like to share in terms of what you love about your job, the highs, and any sort of challenges or things that you don't like quite so much that you'd always like to share? Just being transparent about what a role like yours is like really so if people are thinking about i'd like to do some yeah. low, I want the highs and lows so i think like any job right there's there's going to be the bits that you like and the bits that you don't like and yep. even if you get the perfect job you're, you're the job that you've always wanted in the world there'll still be bits about it that will drive you insane because that's a job right <laughs> so <laughs> um uh, but the the good bits about it is that I get to work with an incredible team of people, um, just like a you know, really, really um, good, knowledgeable group of people who love their subject, love conservation, and um, you know, and, and, and teaching students be having that freedom to create my own scheme of work and and, and be creative in you know, writing the master's program and kind of thinking about. Um, for, that's kind of from a big structural point of view, like writing a whole program, but from a day-to-day -day point of view, being able to decide what I'm going to teach in the classroom and and um, and build my own experiences into that, um, and, and as well as learning loads. You know, you, you teach stuff that you know you will be roped into teaching on modules that maybe are kind of slightly outside of your um, your comfort zone, which then requires you to learn a whole kind of other um, side of your, your game um, and that's challenging definitely but it, I've learned more through teaching um, than than I ever kind of um, did probably at any other point in my um, my educational journey I, I guess so so that's that's always good um, you know challenges as anyone that works within teaching whether it's um, at any level um, it's busy you you're working long hours you're working evenings you're doing weekends prep marking all that kind of stuff so um but then you get time um at other times of the year where you, you have a lot more freedom and you know I, I get to go off and and run the honduras field trip you know every, every couple of years and i get to go some days I'm, I'm working down on the beach or going off and taking students to have uh to uh, to paint in zoo We've got Nuki Zoo right on our doorstep here, which all of our students and staff have um, you know, open access to. So if I want to walk across in my lunch break and have a little walk around the zoo, um, then then I'm free to do that. And, uh, you know, there's not that many places that you can work when you just think, yeah, I just fancy going off and having a, um, 
uh, a little wander and, and having a look at uh, some uh, some endangered species. So, so yeah, that's that's good. I love it. I love it. Where did your passion for wildlife conservation, the environment, like come from? Is it was there a time or a moment, a place? Has it developed over time? Like, where's that kind of it's, ignited from? So it's yeah. Uh, it my first memory of being really kind of inspired, well, just you know, fascinated by by animals. It actually, um, was in Cornwall. We, we came down for a family holiday in Cornwall and stayed with um, cousins when I was very little. And they, um, their sons, they kept snakes. Like the whole garage was full of snakes. And I think obviously this has had some kind of um, uh, long lasting uh, influence on me, having spent a lot of time working now and studying snakes. Um, and so, you know, family holidays in Cornwall kind of with the, the coastline and kind of everything that's here and, and being exposed to, um, just this this house full of, of snakes just I remember it as, a, as a young boy just being uh, obsessed and, and that was it kind of like sounds uh, pretty it, memorable it was, to be honest a house yeah, full of snakes. <laughs> yeah and and um, and you know there, there was always uh, an interest in wildlife and you know, was lucky to have grown up in a family where we, we did a lot of outdoor stuff and getting out and uh, enjoying um, uh, the natural world uh, but then uh, if I'm brutally honest um, probably at school, I you know, I was an okay student, but not you know not always a, a fantastic student. Um, and when it came to choosing what I was going to do at university, there was a big doubt over whether I'd even bother to go to university. Um, and, and and I joke that I kind of was going through university prospectuses, and a lot of them were in alphabetical order. And I was kind of getting to the end, and I was getting to Z, and it was zoology, and it and it was kind of well there's nothing else that speaks to me like that and and I kind of followed my gut I didn't think it was necessarily um at that time I didn't think about whether there were jobs in it um and just thought it's it's something that I'm passionate about that I I would love studying you know if I'm going to go and spend time at university then I'm going to go and do that um and so that's what I did. And I think that that for me, that was the right decision because, you know, studying and doing anything, if, you, if you're not, if your heart's not in it, then you're not going to put mm. yourself into it. So um, that you know, in terms of advice, always kind of do things that interest you, whatever that is. Um, you've got to, you, yeah, you've got to love it to get the best out of it. Um, and, um, and yeah, and, and my, my career in conservation has kind of uh, been a little bit, kind of uh, a similar just kind of stumbling into uh, the next opportunity without, without kind of a necessarily a, a clear plan which I, I always say having a plan is really important but you also just got to constantly be on the lookout for opportunities that just take you in a completely different direction um, and I remember sitting in a lecture theatre so when I was at Cardiff University um, and there was Operation Wallace here, who I eventually ended up going and, and working with. Um, they came to do a presentation about these, these field programs that they were running, expedition opportunities. Um, and I was kind of in my second year of studies at Cardiff. And I wasn't going to go to the presentation because I knew if I went, I was going to want to go. And I didn't have any money. I had no, I couldn't afford to go. It was going to be too expensive. So I had already decided I wasn't going to go to that presentation. And then just because all of my friends, it was a lunchtime thing, they were all going to go to the presentation. And so I reluctantly went along, not reluctantly because I wouldn't be interested, but just mm. I kind of didn't want to put myself in that position of being, ah, this looks great. I'm not going. And I went along and then found out that I could go and study boa constrictors in Honduras. Um, and that was it. <laughs> And and of all of my friends, I think I was the only one that signed up to go away on this thing. And you know, it was the one that was kind of saying I was definitely not going to do it. And um, and and that decision to go was, you know, I started doing all these other things to make money, you know, putting on charity band nights and organizing events and fundraising, working with businesses, getting businesses to donate prizes for fundraising. And, and, and Operation Wallace were really great in kind of giving advice on how to do those sorts of things. And I guess that that kind of set off in, in motion that you know, 
there's there's all kinds of different ways of getting involved and doing things that's you know, in conservation that's um it's not just about the knowledge it's about getting yourself out there it's about funding it's about other things as well and so so i ended up going off and, and doing that and um yeah without giving kind of the, the oh um i guess a <laughs> live story that resulted in an opportunity to go and work with some really fantastic scientists um and work in a field program in in, in honduras out in, in the casca chinas the hog islands running around chasing boa constrictors and i did that for summer came back and wrote up my dissertation and um and then that allowed me to then go back out the the following year as a as a as a research staff member after graduating um and and eventually that kind of snowballed into a phd running around chasing snakes around on an island and um and then various other things um so uh yeah uh, that's it's 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 a evolutionary biology and conservation of the hog island boa constrictor that was your phd i read up here yeah and, and you've done yeah so many other things since then i'm, I'm semi-conscious of time um and i'd love to kind of dig more into your career history but i guess i'd like to ask two things um firstly like looking back at your career like what what do you think you've learned about working in conservation that has enabled you to be successful or to progress or to still be in it and thriving? Like what are the kind of key attributes or things, lessons, reflections? I, I think working with local people um, has been kind of a, a key learning part of this and, and seeing how, how that's been done really well in, in some instances and, and how it's not uh, worked in, in others. And so working in Honduras, I, I kind of saw firsthand where there was kind of a, quite a heavy handed management approach of sort of a top down management approach, enforcement um, and a lot of resentment that came from local communities and kind of understandably and, and how people weren't brought on board to begin with and how that made it really difficult for a long, long time. You know, reversing those kinds of things takes years generations potentially even um and so I, I would say that one of the main things that that i've learned is that you you really have to get the local communities on board mm. and involve them incentivize them and, and find some way of them um taking ownership of of their um of their own biodiversity and their own wildlife rather than us kind of just telling them uh we're telling people what to do and that work, whether we're talking about it, whether i'm working in honduras and kind of international or if i'm working locally in cornwall um mm. it doesn't matter what the scale it's like if you're going and, and talking to people about what they should be doing in the place that they live then um yeah you you have to respect um their position and and who you are going into that that situation and you know I, I, i've definitely um learned through making mistakes and, and you know, kind of uh not not getting people on board early enough in, in some instances um so that would be my one yeah. one of the things one of the many things that i've learned through my own mistakes i guess it's that recurring theme actually we hear on this podcast you've mentioned it already people get into conservation because they're interested in wildlife and nature and it very quickly becomes about people and behavior change and how you work with communities and or stakeholders or whatever you want to call them in different contexts yeah what um what a careers advice would you offer people this is my other my second piece of the second prong of the question like we have some people listening here today there'll be people listening to the podcast later as well um you know people who are looking to start their career, whether they're a career, a graduate of a master's program or a degree program, whether a, a career switcher, what advice would you offer someone looking to kind of secure their first kind of paying role? I think put, your, you know, put yourself out there. Don't be afraid to send that email and don't be afraid to send lots of emails, you know, contact people and, and networking and, and don't, don't assume because you're early in your career that people aren't going to want to hear from you and want to know about what you're doing. Actually, you can offer a lot because as people progress through their careers, the one thing they don't have is time to do all the, the fun mm. stuff. You know, like, oh, I'd love to be out in the field doing all kinds of stuff. And the, and I can't. Um, 
because I'm busy doing much less interesting things. Um, and so if you have time and you can commit to doing something, you can really show um, you know, that you're dependable and you can work with that person. And so it's building those relationships that might initially mean that you're needing to sort of do some, some voluntary work. But what I found is that you know, all the voluntary stuff that I've done and when I have had to pay that little bit of extra investing in myself at the beginning, that's come back you know, tenfold um, eventually. Um, but I recognise that you know, there is a, um, a difficulty, especially with kind of how um, everyone's struggling with um, cost of living crisis now. It's not easy to um, give time for free, but mm -hmm. whatever time that you can give, doing something you love and you enjoy so it shouldn't feel so much like kind of uh, work, then just do it and send those emails. Just talk to people um, and don't be afraid to, um, to ask for things. Mm. Brilliant advice. Thank you. Yeah. As we wrap up then over the next sort of five minutes, so I want, to ask, I want to ask you some sort of bigger, more open questions just to kind of hear how you kind of think and what you feel about the kind of the sector, if you like. Nice, easy one to get. Well, maybe not even easy. I don't know. If if you could go and see one species in one location on the planet, like where would we take you and what would you look to to experience? Oh, that is, that's a really tough question. One species, anywhere that I could go. Um so I, I I worked a lot with well I've worked with reptiles mainly uh, and amphibians to a, to a certain extent and I guess that um, if if I was sticking with kind of reptile theme um, you know if we we're talking about snakes uh, seeing a a king cobra <laughs> would be pretty pretty impressive. I, I I'm not one of those herpetologists that's going to go and suddenly kind of uh, go and grab a cobra and start making yeah. it around. Um, I, I'm not quick and nimble enough for all that sort of nonsense. Um, but but I think as as you know, such a an impressive snake and and a komodo, you know, komodo dragons as well. You know, that would be um, pretty much yeah, well up there. But um, yeah, I, I don't have a favourite species. Geez, as uh, at all, I, I think that there's um, there's a lot of beauty in in, in everything. It's just uh, you know, I, I'm really interested in the kind of the how stuff came about. That you know, the, those yeah. questions of like why stuff is the way it is. Um, but but yeah, if I if I had to pick, yeah, maybe amazing, amazing. One thing that we hear about as people interested in wildlife per se is that. Um, wildlife biodiversity whatever you want to call it nature is in decline it often sharp decline in different areas of the planet and conservation yes we're having lots of wins and we're kind of you know having lots of positive outcomes broadly speaking we're still losing the battle um what do we as a movement need to be better at or do more of to have more impact yeah big question yeah um I think what we need to probably as a movement, as sort of a, a, we need to be better at recognizing that we are often in a bubble. Um, we're talking to one another and and we think that we're having an impact because people are turning up to meetings and they're nodding and they're smiling and they're agreeing and, and you know, um, but actually we're just talking to one another and no one else is really listening. So what we need to get better at is finding ways in which we can find common ground with people who can benefit from biodiversity. Um, you know, and and that, some of that's really difficult. So they're difficult, uncomfortable conversations, possibly. Maybe some people will, will kind of have... Uh, ethical issues with some are kind of the sustain, you know, sustainable harvest. Well, you know, so hopefully it's sustainable harvesting, but you know, harvesting and offtake and kind of using wildlife, um, the economics behind it. But I think that we need to, yeah, we need to recognise that conservation. That there's going to be a place of protected areas, but we're only really going to conserve wildlife when the people that aren't listening start to listen, and they're only going to listen when they recognize that there's some benefit to them, their families, you know, their children, um, and and improving their their overall well-being because people are suffering.
suffering and people are, are kind of being, uh, you know, it, people are struggling and, and we can't expect people to go on and continue struggling and conserve biodiversity. So it's that sort of like working with those communities um, and hearing them to try to find better solutions, but also then um, really kind of hammering that message home to, to people uh, you know, at the top who are kind of in positions of power. Um, but yeah, I, conscious of the time, but you know, having some really interesting conversations with my students at the moment about activism and what that looks like and kind of positive activism versus kind of maybe um, more... Um, you know, say questionable sort of things that you know, what what works right? What what's going to actually get the outcomes that wants, and and how can people have really positive impacts and um you know and things that they'll learn on the course hopefully as part of this masters is is you know, how do you do that? How do you get human behaviour change? How do you focus your messages? How do you you know run campaigns and raise money so that you can do all these amazing things that you want to do and and actually have that impact. Yeah, amazing. And on that positive note, yeah, thank you, Stephen, for jumping on the podcast, sharing your precious time with us. Um, it's been a real pleasure talking to you and getting to know you and working together into the future. I'm really, really excited about everything. If people want to find out more about particularly the Master's Programme, Master's in Conservation Project Management, or it might be Master's in Conservation Management, so um, where should they go? Where should we send them? Okay, so if you... At the moment, the the program is advertised on uh, our website, um, so New York University Centre, um, uh, as MSc Conservation Project Management. So if you if you search for that, that or kind of look on our website for that, then that should pop up. Um, you can make you can apply through the the page, and then you'll be sent kind of a um, an application, sort of the full application form. Um, if you want to ask me any questions then um i don't know if it's possible to um share my email address as part of absolutely this, but, yeah um, if you're happy with that we can um, yeah. but yeah it's, it's just um stephen with a ph dot green at cornwall.ac.uk uh you can find me on linkedin um uh so you feel free to drop me a, a line to uh to ask uh, anything you like um and you know it's it's a it's a new program and i would say that in, in terms of what's on the website at the moment, it, there's still um, some some content that needs to, to go up and be revised um, and, and things. So um, whilst that process is happening and there's more information that's going up, then yeah, just drop me an email. Uh, happy to have a have a conversation. Um, and you know, if there's a, if there are people that want to to know more, we can kind of uh, set up a an online meeting where we can have a, have more of a chat about it. Amazing. Okay. Well, thanks again. It's been really nice chatting to you, Stephen, and uh, fingers crossed for a great launch in September. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Nick. And uh, yeah, thanks to Conservation Careers for all your um, support. It's been a, been a really great collaborative project. So looking forward to seeing where it goes. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that everyone. If you did, then please do hit the subscribe button to get notified of new episodes as they drop. And also please give us a rating or a review because it really helps us to get in front of more people and we really enjoy reading them all. As you'll have heard, our podcasts are now recorded in front of a live audience who sit in and listen to the chat. And then after the mics are turned off, they get a chance to talk to the host, to share their thoughts, and also to ask questions. It's a really great format. If you'd like to be in the audience, all you need to do is join the Conservation Careers Academy. Now, in the Conservation Careers Academy, you'll get full access to the world's biggest conservation job board, listing over 15,000 jobs, volunteer, and internships across the globe each year. You'll also enjoy access to our amazing CC Pro private members community with regular events, networking and support. Plus you'll get full access to our growing library of career boosting resources, guides and templates. And best of all, it only costs a few dollars, euros or pounds per month to join the academy. Now to find out more, please visit conservation-careers.com forward slash academy or simply click the join button at the top of our website. See you on the inside.